let let me start because uh, I did the invitation and uh, I just uh, called uh, Professor Gibri. First of all, good afternoon, everybody. And I just called him and uh, he messed up the time and he thought it was at seven. So he started running to come to end. I said, okay. <laughs> but he, he told me that in five minutes uh, he will join us. He was in the in the middle of the street. But I can I can uh, introduce the well the program uh, in which uh, the Professor Givrin is uh, uh, well is included and uh, the Center for for Dry Land Agriculture. And I can start to talk about it, and then he will uh, make uh, make the rest. So the the our invitee today is uh, Professor Gibrin, and he is uh, the leader of uh, one of the I think 40, 42 maybe uh, uh, centers of uh, excellence in Africa. Uh, the Centers for Excellence in Africa, uh, it's a World Bank program. Uh, they are now in the second edition. So the first edition had about 20 something centers. And now I think they have about 42. Uh, and uh, they have centers for excellence in five, uh, five different areas. One is health. The other one is uh, mathematics and physics, I think. The other one is water. The other one is technology, information technology, and the other one is uh, agriculture, agriculture and food. Uh, and uh, of course, the center of uh, uh, for dryland agriculture is in one of the centers in in agriculture, and we have twelve centers in in, in the agricultural sector. Uh, this program is located in West Africa. So all the centers are in uh, West Africa. Uh, we're talking about uh, Nigeria, Mali, Togo, uh, Ghana, a few more countries. Uh, and they have both English speaking countries and French speaking countries. Uh, the and they have they they are already in the second edition. The first edition was called uh, Centers of Excellence in Africa, and this uh, second edition, which started about one year ago, one and a half years ago maybe, uh, is called the Centers of Excellence in Africa for Impact. So they are uh, worried about uh, the real impact that these centers can have at the national and at the regional level. Um, I'm, I, I don't want to talk a, a, a lot about the Center, the Center for Rural and Agriculture because he will talk about it. Uh, but uh, the way the, the, these centers work is this program uh, will last four years. Each, uh, each center has a project to develop the center. Uh, the project lasts four years, and all the centers have the same budget, uh, and the budget is uh, six million dollars. So each center has six million dollars to develop the well, the, the center, and uh, these six million dollars are used for four, uh, let's say, four or five types of activities. Professor Gibrin, welcome. Hello, Professor Gibrin. You, you can hear me well, yeah? You can. Yes. Ah, Professor Jibrin, how are you? Good afternoon. Uh, you have a problem with your uh, microphone, I think. Let's 
tabii ki bileyim. Ah, now you're there. Now we can see you. No, no, no. Uh, yes, we can see you. But still not here. Uh, we cannot we cannot hear you very well. This the sound is very low. Can you hear me now? Uh, not very well. A bit better, but uh, still. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, now perfect. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Ah, okay, great. I was just. Yeah. Uh, Thing. Now I have to interrupt to thank you uh, for for being here with us uh, and uh, for accepting this uh, invitation. Uh, I took this uh, five minutes uh, to to um, to explain a bit uh, what is the what is the ACE uh, program and uh, that uh, the ACE program has centers in different subjects. One of them is agriculture and that CDA. Uh, is within uh, is within the agricultural subject of, but uh, I, I didn't want to to tell uh, uh, much more than that because uh, we were of course we want to hear from you and not from me, but uh, just to say thank you I was just just to finish, I was saying that the centers got this uh, six million budget over four years, uh, basically for four or five different activities, uh, including uh, postgraduate students, uh, developing the center in terms of quality. And certification uh, and uh, doing the regional activities and projects with other with other centers but i'm sure that professor jibin can tell us uh, more about it so thank you for for being here uh, today we have about uh, well two hours or a bit less than that now uh, and uh, we have mainly uh, we as i we told you uh, we have this development studies program phd program so our audience is uh, composed of uh, students of the program, but also some lectures of the program and some invitees that uh, we, we, we asked to be here. So thank you for being here. And uh, the floor is yours. Ah, you're back. When I know, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, when when you want to start, please go ahead. Okay. okay very sorry. Uh, <laughs> I had to send network. I I had an issue with the with the connection. It's not stable. So I hope we are not going to have much problem. I'm going to uh, put up the video. Maybe it will be better. And yeah, yeah, maybe it's better. Yeah. I want to. Yeah, and I want to share my screen now. So, uh, can you see my screen. I can. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Luis, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. I apologize sincerely. Uh, in in the mail, I saw six o'clock uh, GMT, so which which is normally six plus one hour. Uh, I'm sorry for for connecting late. I'm going to be talking to you about enhancing Africa's capacity for delivering high quality training and applied research to address 
regional development development challenges. I will be sharing our experience at the Center for Dryland Agriculture. So, uh, for a start, I want my presentation to to follow this outline. I'm going to highlight uh, some of the development challenges in Africa and the need for high quality, higher education in addressing them. Then I will briefly talk about the World Bank Africa Centers of Excellence model. I will then give a short uh, case study of what we are doing at the Center for Dryland Agriculture. And I will end with uh, some of the key successes of the ACES from Nigeria. So the development challenges of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa are quite many. And as you may all know, Sub-Saharan Africa is having one of the largest shares of the global poor. More than 51% of the people there live in extreme poverty. And this trend, even though there are some improvement in GDP across the, in the last two decades or so, but at the rate of uh, the development in the world, by 2030, almost 90% of the poor in the world will likely be residing in Sub-Saharan Africa. And some of these poor are characterized by some attributes such as low level of education, uh, most of them are employed in the agricultural sector, and more than half of the poor are very young, less than 25 years of age. So there is need to address these issues. Even though there has been some improvement in uh, some growth rate in, in the economy of Africa, some of the benefits are not obvious because of the population and the limited opportunity for high skilled jobs. And also the wealth created is generally given to promote the economy. Growth, there has to be diversification in the human capital development. Presently, exploitation of natural resources without adding much value. It needs to move up and specialize by investing more in knowledge intensive and high value added activities. However, we have very low institutional capacity for this at the moment. We need to train sufficient number of professionals with the requisite technical skills for critical thinking that will produce research products and technologies and services that will address the problems we are facing. And if you check most of the uh, high priority sectors in Sub-Saharan Africa are uh, having very low level of indigenous uh, experts. We have uh, so many graduates that are uh, unemployed, but they cannot fit into many of the high value uh, jobs that are available. So we have over reliance on expert rates and international consultants to carry out important projects and activities within the region. Uh, this can be reflected by, by looking at the availability of scientists and engineers index from the Global Competitive Report of 2017 to 2018, in which Nigeria was ranked 17th out of 107 countries in terms of availability of scientists and engineers. This is uh, in spite of Nigeria being the seventh most populous country in the world. So you can see the need for training high level skills is very, very high, very dear in, in Nigeria and similar countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Also, if you make comparison between Korea and Sub-Saharan Africa, in Korea, you have about 6,899 researchers 
per every 1 million inhabitants. While in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have only 88 for every 1 million inhabitants. Uh, the present investment in our education and expenditure in research is only 0.8% in 2014, which is, which is extremely low. So it is important to have programs and projects that will equip the workforce with relevant science and skills and competencies that will address many of the challenges we are facing in various sectors. We presently train most of the high level skills outside of Saharan Africa. We spend a lot of money to US, to Asia, and so on. And many of them end up not being it is there. But if we can, if we can train more scientists here, giving them opportunities and facilities for world standard training, we will spend much less, and it's most likely we are going to return them here to contribute to the development of the region. So some of the key challenges facing the education sector in sub-Saharan Africa that need to be addressed for us to produce the kind of product and they don't impact to the economy. Also, we have a limited quantity of uh, graduates in the key priority areas of uh, engineering, science, technology, and areas that are in high demand presently. There is also a very little collaboration between various institutions within the region. For example, if you check publications around, publications from uh, Nigeria or from Europe, if you see international collaboration, most of it will be between Africans and people outside Africa. You have very few collaborations between African countries. Maybe if Nigeria and Ghana or Nigeria and Nigeria and so on. And if collaboration internally between the different countries in society so that we can get more from the little investment we're, we're making. Of course, there is a inadequate financing which, which underscores the need for, for this kind of uh, collaboration between the different countries. Also, the programs we are running presently, most of them are not responsive to the actual needs of the region that can address the development challenges we're having. So we need to have serious interventions, both nationally and regionally between the countries in order to address these uh, key challenges. And that inform why the World Bank Africa Centers of Excellence project was introduced. The project tends to promote specialized regional centers, which will focus on single thematic areas. So instead of uh, every country producing several centers that will address different things, the project promotes having a particular center that will serve the region in a particular thematic area. For example, you have a center for dryland agriculture or a center for climate change research or a center for infectious disease uh, research that can be in Ghana or in Nigeria or in Mali, but taking and training students and doing research across the region. That uh, will improve regional collaboration and also will make the various countries invest in priority areas and work together to, to reap the benefit together. Also, the S project promotes strong linkage with the private sector and industry. Before now, most of the programs in our universities uh, the curricula of the programs did not get inputs from the private sector, from employers. And that is why many of the graduates were not readily employable because 
their training did not respond to the needs of the employers. The S project also tends to promote good governance and institutional ownership. So in 2014, the centers were the first S centers were competitively selected. And the model of the operation of the S is, is what the World Bank refers to as results-based financing. Instead of the normal uh, World Bank funding in which you get a percentage of, of uh, the facility and get additional uh, percentages after some time. In this model, there are certain key results that are achieved by the centers and those results are costed. So the funding depends on how well a center performs in the key areas that are identified prior to the commencement of the project. The first uh, center was established in 2014. There are 22 centers in West and Central Africa covering nine countries. Then uh, after two years, the benefits of established centers started becoming obvious. So the second set of uh, centers was established for Southern and Eastern Africa called the S2. There were 24 of such centers. And presently from 2018, third S project centers were launched called the S for Development Impact Centers. Many of them were involved in the first S project in West and Central Africa. And some of the performing centers, well-performing centers were now incorporated into the S3 project. The difference between the S2, S3 project or S impact and the other earlier S projects is that in this case, there is going to be a much more stronger linkage with uh, the industry. And there's going to be more emphasis on development impact at both the national, regional and the university level. So the, the model of the S learning is in such a way that the training and research are done in the normal way. However, the problems should be identified together with communities. They should be addressing specific uh, issues that can address some of the development challenges of, of, of the region. And there should be feedback at the end of the day that will inform policy and lead to development of product and services that will address the development challenges of the region. So, even though you are going to have the normal publications as we have with normal basic research and so on, but there will be stronger emphasis on addressing the needs of the society and to address real life problems. I think so I'm now going to talk a little bit about the Center for Dry Land Agriculture and about uh, what we have been doing in the past uh, five years or six years. Uh, Luis, can I have a feedback? Uh, sometimes my internet is, is unstable. I hope you are hearing me. Yes, we are. We hear you well. And sometimes we get some, uh, I don't know, three, four seconds oh, interruption. But uh, no problem, because it's not often, so we can follow you perfectly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the, before I talk about the Center for Dryland Agriculture, uh, it's good to even understand why drylands do matter. Drylands are, are, are areas that are extremely fragile. They have very high temperatures and very little uh, precipitation, low water. So such areas of uh, what we call aridity index, the proportion of the annual precipitation against the potential evapotranspiration of less than 0 0.65. Such areas are quite dry and they are referred to as uh, dry lands. Dry lands account for about 45% of the global land and 
about 35% of the global population. So it's, it's really a very large area. In Nigeria, more than half of the country can be, can be described as, as, as dry land. It covers from the, the central region of the country to the, to the extreme north. Of course, there are different uh, levels of the dryness from the very arid, very, very dry, the arid region to the dry subunit. Some of the characteristics of uh, dry lands, of course, uh, like I said earlier, about 35% of uh, global population live in dry lands. In Africa, especially East and West Africa, there are more than 300 million people living in these dry areas. And with changing climate and increasing population, the figure is projected to increase by about 65 to 80% by the year 2030. A large proportion of the people here live on natural resource-based livelihoods such as farming, herding, and extraction of uh, natural resources. So some of the problems that are faced in other parts of Saharan Africa are even more severe in dry lands because of the fragile nature of the natural resources. The ecosystems are quite vulnerable to over exploitation. This often results to, to conflicts in addition to land degradation and, and uh, environmental degradation. Most of the agriculture in these areas are not technology driven and they are characterized by a lot of losses, both during production as a result of pests and diseases, uh, poor handling, and also post harvest losses after getting the yield because of poor post-service practices and post-service production issues. These are some of the reasons why you have squalor and a lot of uh, hunger and poverty problems in, in the dry lands. But despite all these uh, multidimensional problems, the dry lands also have uh, some, 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 some good potentials if they are properly harnessed. So the, some of the, about most of the livestock holdings in Africa are in the dry land areas. The potential of these areas also are rooted in the richness of the biodiversity in spite of the dryness, the vastness allows for diverse possibilities. And there are opportunities, especially in the less dry areas for intensification of agriculture. But this must be done uh, based on knowledge-based decisions. Otherwise, the fragility will increase. What stops the region from harnessing these potentials include, uh, of course, uh, some of the issues with weak governance, the shortages of skilled manpower, which can only come from better targeted and better education, and also low investment in technologies to address some of these issues. So the solutions are deeply rooted in getting quality education, uh, high education through better teaching, through uh, development of uh, development-based research and effective uh, outreach are some of the key pathways for, for addressing these issues. With better manpower, we are going to have much more efficient production of crop and livestock, which will lead to better incomes and better livelihoods for the impoverished populations here. And this will lead to prosperous uh, society and less conflict. So this is our, our thinking, our impact pathway is we can help to address the challenges of the dryland region leading to prosperous uh, societies 
by addressing the root causes of the underdevelopment through the training with high quality education, producing skilled manpower, better research and research products. So our center, the Center for Drug and Agriculture is located in Bayero University, which is in the uh, northern part of Nigeria. The center was established in 2012, just two years before the start of the S project. The center was established uh, with a small takeoff grant from the MacArthur Foundation of uh, about 8,000 US dollars. And we admitted our first MSc students in 2013 and uh, the first PhD students in, in 2014. The grant helped us to, to establish uh, smoothly because we were able to consult widely. So uh, right from the beginning, we conceived the center as, as, as a regional center because we know the, the issues we are addressing are not localized issues. They are issues that cover the, the whole of the region. And fortunately for us, just the, about two years into the establishment of the center, there was a call from the World Bank for the establishment of the Africa Centers of Excellence. We applied and we were successful after going through the rigorous selection process. And we got a grant of 6.8 million US dollars. Uh, during the midterm review of the centers of excellence, we got additional $1 million because we are rated as one of the better performing centers. In 2018, another call was made for the third Africa Centers of Excellence project called the S Impact. And again, we were successful in getting a grant of five million US dollars to be uh, one of the S impact centers. Also uh, in 2019, we competed to be a host institution under the partnership for innovation in applied science, engineering and technology, PASIT. PASIT is a, is a regional initiative uh, supported by the World Bank, some African governments, Korea, and some key partners to train 10,000 PhD students on the continent in, in key priority areas. And the, the program uses a sandwich model in which uh, the students apply to an African university, uh, register there, spend a semester or two, then go to another host university for a sandwich program for between six months to two years, depending on the research project they are doing, and then come back to complete the, the program in an African institution. So the, the, the first set of Africa host institutions were 11, and our center was one of the 11 successful uh, centers to, to host the PASEC program. So th there's a lot of synergy between what is expected in the PASEC project and what we are doing also in the World Bank S project activities. Our programs, of course, are anchored on providing training, uh, research, and outreach. And from the earlier S model, I showed the three activities are intertwined, uh, the research training and, and, and outreach activities are, are intertwined. We run MSc and PhD programs in four priority areas. We also run a postgraduate diploma in dryland agriculture, and we run various short professional courses. All our MSc and PhD students are required to spend uh, at least a minimum of one month internship in the private sector industry. So that uh, they, they understand the issues in the private sector and find ways of addressing Okay, so our programs and like I said, uh, we run MSc and PhD programs. These are some of the programs we run. There's a 
natural resource management and climate change. There's agronomy, crops and cropping systems in dryland. There's animal science, and there's livelihood and natural resource economics. All these are, are MSc and PhD level. And recently we introduced MSc in agricultural technology. All our programs are nationally accredited by the National Universities Commission. And this is a, a, a new thing because before now, PG programs in Nigeria did not need to be subjected to accreditation processes. But the coming of the S project uh, required that programs should be accredited both nationally and internationally. So we started with the national accreditation, which all our programs uh, got, except the new one we introduced recently. And also we submitted our two programs two years ago for international accreditation by HSRS in France. And we got a five-year all reserved uh, accreditation for the two programs we submitted. Last year, we presented uh, the remaining six programs for accreditation and we're we are awaiting the, the results of the exercise. We had the on-site visit in, in January. So we're we are awaiting, awaiting the results of the accreditation from HSRS. The different programs, natural resource, livestock production, crop production, are run in a multidisciplinary manner because, of course, uh, we are operating from, from the same biophysical and socioeconomic environment. And many of the issues are, are, are interrelated. Some of the issues to do with the livestock production affect the crop production, affect the management of the environment and have effect on the on the climate so we try to make our training and research to be multidisciplinary and and to view things from different perspectives and and, and different angles uh, presently we have students from all over Africa we have students from from the Gambia in the west coast of Africa down to Kenya and Ethiopia in the in the eastern part of Africa. Also, and this is very important because before, before the S project, there were virtually no foreign students in most Nigerian universities, especially the universities in Kano, the northern part of Nigeria, because of many perceptions about security and so on. And I think it's one of the success stories of the S project to, to have uh, students from 13 countries across Africa presently studying in our university from zero. And also we have established reasonable facilities, good facilities for teaching and research. We have a good network of national, regional and international uh, partners that we are collaborating with who are involved in our research activities involved in teaching advising our students. Uh, these are just some of the laboratory facilities and activities we are doing. We have executed many research development uh, projects through our graduate students and also through some external funding and also working with uh, different strategic uh, donors and strategic partners, such as the International Crop Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics, ICRISAT, uh, International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, and so on. And we have executed uh, a number of regional and national projects that have impacted uh, uh, various communities. Uh, like I mentioned, we have reasonably well-equipped facilities for teaching and, and, and research, which were not there before the S project. And now our students spend less time for their research work and also do more quality research as a result of the facilities available. Uh, these are examples of some of the things that are now there, which were, were not there before the S project. And that has uh, also empowered us to work much better with various uh, communities, various uh, stakeholders across the region in our, 
uh, outreach activities to promote uh, So this is just a few of some of the partners that are involved with us in research activities or student supervision or teaching. Uh, it's not exhaustive, there, there are others. So some specific uh, success stories I can summarize from our involvement in the S project. For the Nigeria ACES, we have uh, three centers, I mean, uh, 10 centers in Nigeria, three of them in agriculture, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and four in the health sectors. Uh, under S1, these 10 centers in Nigeria have trained 934 PhDs using uh the new facilities new teaching methods and uh, new approaches introduced through the s project we have also trained 3296 msc graduates and we have uh, carried out short courses and trained more than almost 9000 uh, students on professional short courses to address specific uh, issues within their profession. Centers almost all got their program and also a graduate uh, now hello the connection is not very good now That's, oh, yeah, I think it went down. Uh, let's wait a little bit. I think uh, he was here and then it felt again. Professor. Yes. Uh, does it possible to take this uh, presentation because it will be more easy for us when we are writing our uh, assessment and we, we couldn't for example i i couldn't catch some points so yeah, it will be course. much better for us to also read the presentation yeah of course we can ask we can ask in the end and uh, I, i'm sure that okay. it can be uh, thank you for I, your... i'm back i apologize the the network keeps keeps uh -huh. going uh, is, is, is some of the some of the challenges uh, we but, face uh, sometimes. It, but it was good for uh, for uh, for some minutes. 
And uh, now in the last uh, minute or so, it went completely down. But let, let, let's restart because it was going uh, it yeah. was, uh, good. Uh, but we don't see the presentation now, Jibni. Yes, I'm, I'm trying okay. to share. Thank you, thank yeah. you. So uh, I, I, was, I was just uh, trying to, to conclude. I said uh, there were a few key successes such as training large number of PhDs, more than 934 PhDs in the 10 centers in Nigeria, not, not the 22 in the, in the, in the whole uh, S1 project. We, we had more than 3,000 MSCs trained and nearly 9,000 short courses that are trained better to address the, some of the development needs of the region. We have developed some research outputs that have directly addressed uh, some of the needs of industry. And uh, some of the centers in the health sector have played very important roles in the control and containment of Ebola, Lassa and COVID pandemics when they emerged, especially the Africa Center of Excellence in Infectious, uh, in the genomics of infectious disease. Also, all the centers have uh, greater revenue generation as a result of their better involvement with the industry and their better ability to generate research funds. There is also increase in publications and visibility of the centers because now the centers are required to publish in index journals, all like the, the past. And there's generally better regional networking between the various centers. So uh, on this note, I conclude my, my presentation. <laughs> Obrigado. Obrigado. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Luis. Uh, you are more used uh, to to the to these talks than me. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I I think it follows a uh, question is in answer. So uh, I don't think I don't need uh, it. Does need moderation? So please go ahead uh, and and ask whatever you you'd like. I think I think it's this is it. It's the floor is open, so please you can ask all your questions or comments to Professor Gibri. I think you you might uh, you you may stop sharing your screen. Maybe it's more uh, okay. easy for us to follow if someone. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Can I can I go? Sure. Uh, sorry, I, uh, my cam cannot come on now because of my current location. Uh, thank you, Professor Jibri, for, for that uh, presentation. Sometimes the internet um, interrupted very key uh, part of the speech as you were presenting. Um, I'm, I'm actually in the PhD in development studies, and I happen to be from Nigeria as well. Uh, but my question basically quickly is, I want you to understand the link between your center, ACE, program as a whole and policy formulation from the government. So what is the linkage? So you train, you do research and all that, but what's the linkage with the government programs and policies, both for Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole? I, I, I didn't quite get that in your presentation. Okay. Okay. So the, the link between our S and the government, uh, first of all, uh, the emphasis is on getting better training, better research, and coming up with uh, science-based, evidence-based uh, decisions that can inform government policy. And some of the ways we, we, we do is we, we organize uh, workshops and discussions with uh, governments. For example, we normally hold a biannual dryland conference in which we make presentations of the various uh, research and activities we are doing and also others 
are doing similarly across uh, the region and across the world. At the end of the day, we synthesize uh, communique and policy briefs, which we, we share with the government. And an important key uh, component of our setup is that we have an industry advisory board. In our own case, our board, our industry advisory board is chaired by the director of the Federal Department of Agriculture, which is the main department in the Federal Ministry of Agriculture that drives uh, the activities of the ministry. So every thing we do is uh, informed by this industry advisory board, which has a private sector and so on, but is chaired by the director of the Federal uh, Department of Agriculture. So th there is a, a two-way communication between us and our activities and with especially the Federal Ministry of uh, Agriculture. But in Nigeria, you know, the in agriculture is, is one of the things that is on the concurrent list. So uh, it's not only the federal government policy, but also there are policies at the state and local government uh, levels. And at those levels also, we, we, we involve the agricultural development projects, which are in charge of agriculture in the states in most of our activities and in, in, in giving them some of our key policy uh, the briefs that uh, affect some of their uh, operations. Okay, thank you. Hello, hello, Professor um, Mohamed. My name is Fifi from Ghana. I'm, I'm also a PhD student yeah. and I'm from Ghana. I, 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 I just wanted to understand um, with all these interventions in terms of training and upskilling up uh, for the agriculture sector. And of course, with, within this, um, you mentioned within between the period of 2014 and 2020, you produce about four, 938 researchers. I just want to find out what has been the impact. One, for example, in extension services to the agriculture community. And then what are, what, how might that also translate in terms of the yield? And then especially issues regarding food security in Nigeria. Has there been any impact? And do you have any specifics in terms of figures to, to, to share with us or tell us briefly in terms of when you started, what has been the yield, what has been the uh, impact in terms of yield and then also issues regarding food, food, food security. Thank you. Okay, so the, 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 the number of PhDs I indicated is not just for our center. Our center was just uh, 84 within those period, 84 PhDs. But if, if you talk of uh, impact nationwide, uh, it's going to take some time to translate into wide scale, uh, large scale impact is not something that will happen in, in four or five years. You, you need to, it's something that will come down the line. But there are specific uh, areas you can, you can give example. For example, we have run, we have run specific projects uh, targeting maize producers in the, the central part of Nigeria. And one of the problems they face is that for the whole mass producing areas of Nigeria, there's one blanket recommendation on fertilizer use. And you know, conditions are different, soils are different and so on. So together with uh, many of our partners, we carried out uh, research uh, and develop a fertilizer recommendation tool that will advise uh, farmers based on their various conditions on the right type of fertilizer to apply in order to get better returns on their inputs. So in, in, in that kind of research, I will say the impact is one, we have a tool that extension workers are using to guide farmers. And as of last season, uh, Sasakawa Africa Association, which is an extension agency you are working with, and OCP Africa is a Moroccan fertilizer company in Nigeria. They have used that tool to advise more than 30,000 farmers on fertilizer use. Not all of them will have increased yield because the tool advises them on how they will get better efficiency of their products, better returns on the products. 
So it may not be increase in yield, but it will be increase in returns on input use. So, so you can have specific local examples of impact. But if you are talking about national food security at national scale, uh, much more, of course, needs to be done for you to have an impact at that level. But from our centers and other centers, the, the impact I want to emphasize probably is the internal impact. The, the center is now operating differently from how other units of the university is operating, are, are operating. And the other units and the university is now imbibing some of the practices we are doing in the center, which will make them more efficient. And also other universities and other centers are seeing the S project as a, as a different model. So the tertiary education trust fund in, in Nigeria has now identified uh, six centers across Nigeria and is going to fund them in a similar way to the S uh, project. So if you have scaling up of the S's, then you will have the critical number of, of trained skilled manpower that will now eventually make impact in the region or, or in the country. Yeah, can, I, can I add something? Uh, um, just to say that uh, the, these, uh, the, the ACE program is, uh, I think, is very demanding in terms of uh, impact. Actually, uh, um, the, 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 way the, the, the way the centers are funded is uh, through what, uh, what is the so-called uh, disimbursement linked indicators. Mm -hmm. So the centers have to achieve some indicators and uh, the funding is given provided that they achieve those indicators. Uh, or those indicators are, are, are achieved, and it's really demanding in terms of, of the impact they are, the centers are producing uh, at well at national and regional level. Uh, one one of these DLIs, the disimbursement uh, linked indicators, is uh, this DLI two is development impact, uh, and there is after two years and in the end of the project, there is an external evaluation of the development impact of the center. So it's actually this year, this year, all the centers uh, will be evaluated according to their development impact. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, this specific uh, indicator will be evaluated and uh, there is a disimbursement that is linked to this indicator. But of course, as Professor Jirin said, uh, is uh, the large scale impact is uh, sometimes a medium long-term process and uh, it is it's hard to measure it's not easy to measure uh, the impact of, of of any centers hmm. uh, thank you professor Lewis. Uh, perhaps i'm um, um, professor mohammed um, this is fifi again if, um, yes maybe just a follow-up question I, I i i just wanted to find out you mentioned about um Agricultural financing. So, uh, some of your um, project objectives are supposed to also more or less design some financing um, structure or tools. It, it, was that the case? I mean, um, I, I there was some hitches in your presentation. Was it? Do you have, is, it was financing part of the of, of the projects. I mean, helping working with private sector in designing financial financial solutions for the agricultural no. sector, sector. No, no, no. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Can I, uh, Any more questions? Yes, something still uh, on the on the impact. Um, so uh, uh, I'd like to ask you if, uh, uh, for the evaluation Louise just mentioned, if the program has uh, any uh, monitoring and evaluation component of their own or any type of formal evaluation, baseline studies and monitoring education, etc. And if yes, if it's for uh, each center or it's if it's a program uh, for all the the, the excellence uh, centers a common program and who is responsible for uh, its implementation yes there, there is a, a very robust uh, m and e mechanism uh, at the regional level there is the association of african universities which uh, uh, monitors the performance of the centers based on the different uh, indicators. And just like Louis mentioned, the disbursement of the funds to the centers is linked to achieving uh, those indicators. Uh, 
so so there is a association of African universities which is in charge of uh, coordinating the evaluation. Sometimes they use uh, consultants such as Technopolis in France to independently check on on, on those uh, metrics. Also, yeah. nationally in Nigeria, we have the National Universities Commission, which also uh, monitors the performance uh, of the centers. So, so we have it at different levels. Of course, we have our local level, center level uh, M and E mechanisms to ensure we're on track. We have the the monitoring at the national level by the National Universities Commissions for Nigerian centers, and we have the overall. Uh, monitoring by the Association of African Universities on behalf of the World Bank. Uh, George? Yes, I agree. Uh, thank you, Professor Jibrin, for um, your presentation. I, I would like to put the question not so much about the, the ACE and the training process and the PhDs, but on one of the issues that is behind the need of having these centers and, um, and training people in, in, in this area. And you've mentioned the problems of access to land and the scarcity of, of, of land. Uh, and one of the questions I would like to put is, is there research about grab land processes, especially due to the, um, the process by which uh, transnational corporations try to use land in several countries of Africa to large uh, productions of, of com commodities, sorry, with consequences often at the level of expulsion of populations and at least reduction of the areas that they use to uh, develop their more traditional crops or the crops that are used for their daily life. So the question is, do you know anything about the situation on this issue in, in Nigeria or in other places? And is there research by the students involved in the ACE centers on this area or not? Is this, is this a, an issue of concern or, or not in, um, in the centers and among the students? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in, in the dry lands, the, the issue of land is not the vastness of the land, but rather the, the degradability and the pressure on the on the land by various users, such as headers, farmers, and so on. So the issue of a land grab and and and, uh, so, and so on is not a, a serious issue in dry land areas. However, in 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 the humid areas, it's an issue. But uh, in the center for dry land, it's not a major problem for us, and we don't have studies uh, along that line. Thank you. More questions? And can I can I ask again? This is Cosmas. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, I, I know you mentioned um, um, so the issue of um, insecurity, of course, um, in the country and then in the northern part, whether perceived or real. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to know to what extent uh, does it actually impact on you know your your activities and your ability to deliver? Because sometimes when you train people, do research and all that. Uh, you expect that some of them will work within communities or within locations in some of these areas, which uh, for a while we know have some security challenges. So uh, has that actually impacted on your work somehow? Yes, well, uh, first of all, at the beginning of the establishment of the center, it was a bit difficult to, to get foreign students to, to come to Kano to study. As even students from Mali and and Nigeria that uh, from my own perception here in Kano are much more insecure than Nigeria. They, they found it difficult to, to come. So they needed convincing. And what we did was uh, we went on publicity campaigns and offered some incentives through fellowship to get uh, the first set of students to, to come. And once they came, they saw the, the situation in Kano and their fears were allayed. They served as a, 
uh, recruiters for us to, to their stories made other people to to apply and, and come here but uh, in terms of getting people to go out to do research uh, or carry out activities uh, in insecure areas uh, whether in in nigeria or in nigeria or mali or anywhere of course uh, one of the first things you consider is security before you do you do any activity outside so th there are quite a number of uh, of opportunities and activities in the northeast of nigeria and sometimes we are hindered we reject because we feel the places are not uh, secure in 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 other cases we move the either training or the activities to more secure places in the northeast and carry them out there so yes, there is some some limited impact on on some of our activities. All right, thank you. Any other question? No. So uh, I will pass it to Luis uh, that uh, organized the session with me in a minute. Uh, from my side, I just. Uh, would like to thank you again. I think it was really, really uh, interesting, the presentation about the ACE and the and CDA. And I just hope I can uh, be with you soon yeah. uh, <laughs> at your university and that someday you can come to Portugal and then I can invite you for, for dinner in Lisbon. So I hope you can come one day and, and meet us here. So thank you, Jibrin. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I apologize again for, for the poor, also for the, for the mix up in the timing. I, 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 did you hear me? I said I, I apologize for the poor connection and the, and the mix up in the, in the timing. No problem, no problem. It was great. Luis, do you want to add something? Uh, no, just uh, thank uh, Jibrin for this very interesting uh, presentation and thank everybody that was attending and for uh, this. Uh, uh, seminar uh, another one uh, and yes uh, wishing a nice weekend to you all and uh, thank you and see you soon uh, yeah thank you thanks a lot okay thank yeah. you have a nice weekend thank, thank you, you. I don't know if george wants thank to you. Add something uh, thanks a lot bye 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 have a nice weekend bye, -bye.